name is Leslie Gerwin. I am the Associate Director of the Program in Law and Public Affairs I'm here at the Woodrow Wilson School. And it, on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson School, the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics, the Madison Program in, uh, Democratic, in, in American Ideals and Institutions, and the Program in Law and Public Affairs, I'm delighted to welcome you here this afternoon. And I want to thank you for continuing your interest in this important to topic of the impact of the Supreme Court decisions in Citizens United on our democratic political system. It is said that Americans' attention span is quite limited. And as you know, the original uh, intent of this panel, of this program, was to convene shortly after the Supreme Court's decision while it was still fresh news. But as you, many of you know, the snowstorm interrupted that. I would venture to guess now that if we stop most of the people on the street in Princeton and ask them what Citizens United was, we would probably get some blank stares. At the same time, if we talked about politicians, election, money, corruption, and democracy, uh, many people would recall that the issues have a new salience. Um, we will, and we will certainly begin to witness uh, the impact of this decision as we head into an election season in which uh, one longtime court observer said that the hundreds of millions of dollars spent in past presidential and congressional elections are likely to look like a pittance. Uh, for many here today, I suspect that they are waiting for Citizens United versus the Federal Election Committee Commission, uh, the movie. Uh, they, admittedly, it won't be a blockbuster, but there was enough drama uh, to, to probably provide a credible script. When the justices heard arguments the first time, they were unable to reach a decision. The government's attorney advanced arguments uh, that challenged the First Amendment so, uh, so considerably that even the justices who were pro-campaign finance uh, reform had to um, ask or, or, or met, it met with some skepticism. Senator Mitch McConnell, the Republican Senate leader, uh, sh shared, uh, had an attorney who shared the council table with the petitioners while Senators John McCain and Russ Feingold and former representatives Chris Shays and Mark Meehan had an attorney on the opposite side. Uh, there were over 40 friend of the court briefs and the National Rifle so Association and the ACLU uh, found themselves on the same side. Uh, at stake were restrictions on corporate campaign uh, expenditures dating back, some of which dated back to 1907, as well as congressional enactments, limitations on campaign finance, and Supreme Court precedent. All were occasioned by an act, a politically active, conservative leaning organization that sought to broadcast a feature length documentary entitled Hillary the Movie. But while we're waiting for the movie, today we are really fortunate that we have four scholars to help decipher the 176-page Supreme Court decision upon which the drama will be based. We are particularly proud that this year each is associated with, the Princeton, with Princeton University and that they are in a position to explain what the decision says, what it means, what might be its impact, and how those unhappy with the outcome might try to limit the damage and how those who are pleased with it might try to extend its reach. I will introduce each of them in the order that they will give their introductory remarks. Following their, each of their uh, individual remarks, we'll allow some time for them to respond to one another, and then we will open it up to your questions. And I've been asked to tell you both now and at the end that following uh, today's program, there will be a reception and she'll talk, to which you are all invited. Our first speaker is John Dynan. He is the William E. Simon Visiting Fellow at Princeton's James Madison Program. His research focuses on state constitutionalism, federalism, and American political development. He is the author of several books, including The American State Constitutional Tradition and Keeping the People's Liberties, Legislators, Citizens, and Judges as Guardians of Rights. 
He is currently working on a book assessing the role of the Supreme Court in the development of American federalism. When not at Princeton, he hangs out in the political science department at Wake Forest University. He received his PhD from the University of Virginia. Paul Freimer teaches and writes on topics in American law and politics, particularly as they intersect with issues of democratic representation, race and civil rights, and labor and employment. This year, he is serving as the acting director of the program in law and public affairs, where he has served as, where he was a fellow before taking up residence in the Princeton Political Science Department two years ago. Previously, he was on the faculty of the University of California at Paul Santa Cruz and at San Diego, and it's a safe bet to assume he didn't accept Princeton's offer because of the weather. <laughs> he is the author of two books, his latest, Black and Blue, African Americans and the Labor Movement and the Decline of the Democratic Party, won the annual American Political Science Association Award for the best publication on the study of race, ethnicity, and politics. Uh, David Nickerson is currently a visiting scholar at the Woodrow Wilson School Center for the Study of Democratic Politics. When he's not here, he is an assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame. He received his PhD from Yale University. His research primarily concerns how parties and organizations mobilize their supporters. He also utilizes field experiments to study how friends and neighbors influence one another's behaviors and beliefs. He is currently working on a book that provides a theoretical framework for empirical research on voter engagement. He has consulted for a number of partisan and nonpartisan and issue-based campaigns, which is, enables him to bring both a scholarly and experiential perspective to the new developments in campaign finance. Paul Starr is the Stewart Professor of Communications and Public Affairs, Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School of International and Public Affairs. As you may know, he is a scholar, expert, astute observer, and participant in the shaping of public policy and the political process. His book, The Social Transformation of American Medicine, won the Pulitzer Prize and continues to inform the debates over health care over healthcare reform more than 20 years after its publication. He is the co-editor of The American Prospect, a liberal quarterly about politics, policy, and ideas that he founded with journalists Robert Kuttner and the former Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich. His book, The Creation of the Media, Political Origins of American Communications, won the Goldsmith Book Prize. He has appeared before numerous congressional committees and on national television news programs. And so we are delighted that Paul Starr is appearing here along with his colleagues at Princeton University. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. I, I want to focus on the question of how consequential is the Citizens United decision in reality. Now, the early reviews, still evident in some of the commentary, very consequential. Tremendous consequences for campaign finance law was one of the early uh, accounts. Um, and as we know, the ruling even earned mention in uh, the President's State of the Union address, where he said, the decision, quote, reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. This, of course, was the remark that earned a uh, much noted response from Justice Alito. And it also led the Chief Justice Roberts yesterday in a conversation with University of Alabama law students to ponder whether or not justices of the Supreme Court should still attend the State of the Union addresses. Well, such were the early responses. With the pa passage of a little more time, though, we started to see new uh, headlines appear, headlines such as, Citizens United decision not as consequential as it seems. And we also began to see some commentators on both sides of the political aisle uh, begin commenting on the president's uh, reviews, uh, commenting that of the three claims that the president had made in a State of Union address in that the decision reversed a century of law, that it allows spending by foreign corporations, and then it will open up the floodgates to special interests. Of those three, the first was likely incorrect, the second was a stretch, leaving the third for discussion. 
Now, we've had even passage of even more time due in part to the snow delay and the month-long delay as a result. And with that passage of time, I want to argue today that the validity of the second, more revisionist view becomes all the more compelling. That is that Citizens United, all things considered, has modest consequences, whether we look at doctrine or whether we look at the actual practical effects. To say it has modest consequences, though, is not to say that it has no consequences. And let me close by saying where I expect you'll see uh, most of those consequences take place. <laughs> let me start with the doctrinal effects. As has been widely discussed, the case involved Hillary the movie, as we heard introduced here, and it was run by an ideological nonprofit group that took funding, though, from corporations. And they wanted to run this movie, and a video on demand, technically, and they wanted to run advertisements for it in the run-up to the 2008 nomination battle. This would have been seemingly foreclosed by the 2002 McCain-Feingold law, which prevented corporate funded ads of this kind within 30 days of a primary election. And so this led the U.S. Supreme Court, in hearing the case, to decide whether or not this type of ad should be, in fact, precluded from being run. Was it consistent with the First Amendment to preclude it from being run? And this led to an extensive inquiry into the purposes for which government can legitimately suppress campaign expenditures. Well, one purpose has long commanded majority support of the court, and that purpose is to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption, the so-called anti-corruption rationale. This was the grounds by which the U.S. Supreme Court in its landmark 1976 Buckley versus Vallejo decision had upheld limits on direct contributions to political candidates. But Citizens United did not involve a direct contribution to a candidate. Rather, it involved an independent expenditure that wasn't coordinated with a candidate. And so the majority in Citizens United did not view the anti-corruption rationale as leading to the legitimate suppression of this independent expenditure. After all, the majority reasoned, if you aren't giving the money directly to a candidate, how could you be corrupting a candidate? And so the majority said, if you're going to be able to suppress this type of ad, you would have to come from a different rationale other than the anti-corruption rationale. And the leading alternative was the anti-distortion or the equality rationale. That is the idea that you would permit regulation of money in politics to the extent of prohibiting great aggregations of wealth from distorting the political process and leading to unequal influence. Now, the Supreme Court back in 1976 in the Buckley decision had rejected this anti-distortion or, ration or equality rationale. And that's why the court in that case had struck down efforts to limit the overall amount of spending in congressional or presidential campaigns. However, in recent years, this anti-distortion or equality rationale had reemerged and had gained some strength. It had commanded a majority of the court in a 1990 case, Austin versus Michigan, which involved a ban on a state ban on corporate expenditures. It also commanded a majority of the court in the 2003 case, McConnell versus FEC, which upheld the McCain-Feingold law. But these are really the only two cases where this rationale had commanded a clear majority of the court and led to the overturning, uh, led, led to the suppression of speech, of political speech. And the court in Citizens United said its main contribution doctrinally was to determine that this emerging rationale, which had gained hold in a few cases, a few scattered cases, was an unpersuasive. And so the main doctrinal effect of Citizens United was to reject the anti-distortion or equality rationale as a legitimate purpose for suppressing political speech. In the aftermath of Citizens United then, federal and state governments can restrict campaign spending for purposes of regulating corruption, but not under the guise of equalizing influence. So much for the doctrinal effects then. How about the practical effects? How will elections be different? Again, I want to stress the modest effects of Citizens United here in practice as well as in doctrine. My main points are that corporate and union advertising will change, but not all that much. The corporate and union political action committees will continue just as they did before. And that corporate and union direct contributions to candidates will remain prohibited just as it did before. 
Let me take up each of these points in turn. Starting with the types of advertising that corporations and unions could run prior to Citizens United and that what they can run afterwards. And here it'll be helpful just to do a little bit of history with some key dates of 1947, 2002, and 2007. So a little bit of history. Prior to 1947, corporations and unions could spend independently on any types of ads they wanted and with any type of message and at any, type, kind, at any time in the campaign as long as they weren't coordinated with the candidate. But this changed in 1947 when these groups were prohibited from on running ads directly expressing the defeat or victory of a candidate. So after 1947, you could run so-called issue ads. You've all seen them. Senator Johnson is a friend of polluters. Call up Senator Johnson's office and tell him to stop helping out polluters. Okay? It's a classic issue ad. You can say that, but what you couldn't say is, you couldn't add the clinching sentence, vote against Senator Johnson in November. As long as you didn't say that or the equivalent, you were fine. From 1947 onward, this was okay. Well, another change comes in 2002. 2002, the McCain-Feingold plan says, okay, we're gonna tighten this. You now can still run issue ads of this kind, but within 30 days of a primary election and 60 days of a general election, you can't run any ad at all, corporation or union, that mentions a candidate. So that's the new change, the 30 to 60 day rule. You can't even mention a candidate at that point. Final date, 2007. The U.S. Supreme Court cans down a decision in Wisconsin right to life and leads the FEC, Federal Election Commission, to rewrite its rules. And the new rules essentially gut the McCain-Feingold timeline. Essentially, it restores the situation back to where it was before then. In essence, then, at this point, corporations and unions can run any time they want, issue ads, as long as they don't essentially use the magic words, vote for or against this candidate. This takes us to the Citizens United decision in January. Citizens United decision has, in this context, a rather modest effect. Corporations and unions can now add on that magic sentence at the end. Instead of, now they can say, Senator Johnson is a friend of polluters, and instead of having to say, call up Senator Johnson and tell him you don't like him helping polluters, you can add on that final sentence, vote Senator Johnson out of office this November. Now, I'm not sure how many potential voters failed to make that connection before Citizens United. I, but to the extent that anybody didn't get the gist of those issue ads, the main effect of the decision is to allow the corporations or unions to hammer that home. Senator Johnson doesn't just like polluters, you should conclude from that that you should unseat Senator Johnson. You're not just supposed to call his office, you're supposed to pull the lever against him. Now, I should say additionally, businesses and unions can now run several different ads that they couldn't run at all before. They could also run an ad saying, and this would have been not allowed before, um, Senator Johnson is unfaithful to his wife and hasn't paid his taxes in years. Okay, uh, vote him out of office. Or you could say Challenger Smith is a good family man and will do the work of the people of New Jersey. And these were not issue ads they couldn't have been run before. My point here, just to wrap this up on, on, the, on the types of ads that, that, and changes in these ads, is that corporations and unions had been using treasury funds for many years prior to Citizens United in an effort to influence elections. The main effect of Citizens United is to change the wording of these ads and to permit different type of wording that wouldn't previously have been allowed. In short, rather than opening the floodgates to corporate and union ads, it's more accurate to say that the decision changes the wording and the types of ads that they can run. In all other respects, the decision has no effect. It leaves undisturbed all of the various other ways that corporations and unions had been able to make use of political action committees to influence elections. That is, through political action committees, workers in a business can donate to a political action committee, and they can then donate money directly to a candidate or spend independently. This was possible before Citizens United. It remains possible after Citizens United. Moreover, Citizens United doesn't affect various prohibitions that remain in effect. And the main prohibition here is the prohibition on corporations or unions giving money directly to candidates. 
The ban on corporations giving money directly dates back a century. The ban on unions giving money directly to candidates dates back 60 years. These remain completely undisturbed by Citizens United. In terms of any practical effects in federal elections then, Citizens United is unlikely to be rather consequential, but not completely without consequences. And so let me close by taking note of some of the areas in which you might see consequences. As some commentators have noted, some businesses that might not have previously gone through the trouble of setting up political action committees for various reasons, and it is somewhat onerous to do that, might well see the decision as an opportunity to now run ads directly from their corporate treasury funds. Though some businesses more so than others, businesses that pursue what we call access strategies, that really just want to get a hearing from members of Congress, whether Republican or Democratic, aren't likely to see this type of advertisement as a worthwhile one. Too many downsides of running those type of ads. On the other hand, businesses and unions that pursue an electoral strategy that relies on getting elected to office, mostly Republicans or mostly Democrats, that's when you might see these type of ads opening up new opportunities. And that would be the main effect at the federal level. It really is at the state level, though, and in state elections, we are likely to see the biggest consequences to the extent that you will see consequences. Nearly half of the states currently limit corporate or union independent expenditures. Then these states will have to go through the trouble of rewriting their laws, or in some cases reinterpreting them. Colorado even has to change a provision of a state constitution where it prohibited corporate expenditures. But even as we consider the possibility that these changes in state laws will result in changes in the conduct of state elections, it's useful for us to keep in mind that just over the half of the states already permit corporate and union expenditures of the times that are the kind that are now permitted at the federal level as a result of the decision. And the few studies that have looked at whether elections are very different in the states with and without expenditure limits have not so far found clear cases of notable differences. Now maybe the effects will be felt to a greater degree if we focus on particular types of elections, say judicial elections in states with and without expenditure limits. There, there's certainly ground for further analysis. And it's something that certainly deserves further analysis. But so far, the lack of any clear evidence of momentous differences between the states with and without expenditure limits actually serves as additional reason to be cautious about predicting too many momentous consequences from Citizens United, whether in the states without such, with such bans now or at the federal level. Well, two final points in closing then. First, I've, I've stuck um, to the question of will this have effects, and I've, I've tried to make the case that uh, the effects are at best marginal of this decision, and I've left aside the question of, well, will those marginal effects be positive or negative? <laughs> That is, my main case is, my, my main argument here has been today that we're unlikely 5, 10, much less 20 years from today to be holding a retrospective panel on the effects of Citizens United. Certainly not in the way that we're still holding panels 34 years after Buckley versus Vallejo and saying what was the effect of that. So I don't expect those, those effects to be large. On the other hand, the, the effects might be at the margin. <laughs> what, what, what might those effects be, I'll just say um, in, in, in brief here. I suppose it comes down at the end, if one was going to render a verdict here, on whether or not what one is the greater concern, the fear of allowing undue influence by corporate or union funders, or the fear of government supervising which entities will be favored or disfavored in the funding process with the, in the service of equalizing influence. Most of the critical commentary is focused on the first fear of undue influence. The majority in Citizens United, though, focused to a great extent on the second fear of government favoring and disfavoring certain entities, and I would say rightly so. Second and final closing point. The one I suspect of the decision that's most, been most welcome, in my view, has been in the aftermath of the decision, the unwillingness of so many commentators to automatically equate the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution with the meaning of the Constitution itself. There's an all too ready tendency to do that, to make that equation. And in the criticism of the decision, many people have been unwilling to make that equation, have been willing to say the Constitution 
might well mean something other than what a current majority of the court says is the meaning of that constitution. To the extent that that would have long-term consequences, I would see the decision as having a most healthy effect. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I wanted to make three, three comments, focusing more on some of the policy, uh, political implications of the decision uh, than the specific legal, uh, although some of it will, will overlap. Um, the first is going to deal with the, the, the law or more the policy prior to Citizens United, the, the policy of uh, campaign finance. Uh, the second deals with um, uh, one of the principal concerns that has come up with uh, Citizens United, and that is the role for labor unions, uh, in part because labor unions, um, for better or worse, uh, represent uh, the biggest spenders of working class uh, money uh, in campaigns. Um, and then the third is a, is a, a half comment, half question about the role of courts as policymakers. Um, both in our current era and, and more generally. So I'll start with the first, um, uh, the role of, a, of a law and policy prior. Um, I think you know, a number of people have made dramatic comments about uh, what implications Citizens United will have uh, for democracy. And it's worth perhaps starting with the fact that on my left, Larry Bartels wrote a book that came out last year just prior to Citizens United uh, about the New Gilded Age. And on my right, Marty Gillens uh, is also writing about uh, the levels of inequality that already exist in our political system, uh, in our legislative system, um, and in our policy consequences. So to pinpoint Citizen United as a turning point, um, it, if you argue that this is about inequality, to pinpoint Citizen United as a turning point uh, is probably the wrong moment. Um, uh, perhaps there, uh, we could find another moment, but, but it's, it's worth starting with that. Um, a second piece of that. Um, uh, Funnily enough, I never thought this would actually matter uh, since I don't study uh, campaign finance law per se, uh, but when I was in law school, I was actually a, a summer associate, which basically means an intern, uh, at the Federal Election Commission, of all places. Um, now that isn't enough to get a job uh, studying campaign law, uh, but uh, I did learn a number of things just working at the Federal Election Commission. The Federal Election Commission uh, is the uh, enforcement agency that deals with campaign uh, finance problems. Um, and a number of things are of interest uh, in, in working there. One, I mean, is how obviously dysfunctional this agency has long been. Um, uh, the fact that they have a, um, a, a constantly deadlocked on partisan grounds board chair, uh, chairmanship uh, that is constantly divided between uh, an equal number of Democrats and an equal number of Republicans. Uh, it is not designed to be an institution with really any type of authority, any type of power. Uh, interestingly as well um, is that when I was there, and this is uh, uh, almost a decade ago, um, we were dealing with the same issues as the Hillary movie. Not the Hillary movie, because she hadn't run for president yet, uh, but with similar campaign, uh, campaign movies and types of ads uh, at more local level, one in Montana, uh, one in Idaho. Um, the questions were the same. Um, now, a couple of things were of interest to that. One is that um, nobody was scared of the FEC uh, in, in terms of the, the attempts by the FEC to investigate this. Two, the issues that the FEC were dealing with at this time, when I was working there, were already six years old. So, you know, the, the, the ability of the FEC to do something about this um, was, was fairly small. Um, third, and maybe this is the most interesting thing, and I wish I had been able to steal uh, the secret FEC formula, but the FEC has a formula where they, they figure out who it is they should investigate and who they should not. Um, and what's interesting about it is it's much like uh, police officers um, out on uh, the New Jersey uh, turnpike. Actually, New Jersey's pretty ferocious. So I'm from California, and California's a better example, um, meaning that um, if you speed 10 miles over the speed limit, no one's going to stop you. Maybe in New Jersey, but not in California. Um, if you speed 15, again, no one's going to stop you. 20, you might expect to get stopped, but 90% of the time you won't be. Really, the ones that they're going to stop are the people going really, really out of control, zipping across lanes. That's the ones they're going to stop. And that's what the FEC is designed to do, is to stop those types of people. Um, now, one of the frustrations with the FEC is that sometimes they stop somebody going a mile over the speed limit um, who's just poking along and, and not really that worthy. And, and that's, that's a, a separate complaint. Um, but in general, the FEC's role here, I think, it can be likened in much to the the way that uh, Major League Baseball is dealing with steroids this, these days. You know, everybody is violating these. Everybody is playing the loopholes. Um, and I should say with the FEC, Democrats and Republicans, both sides have played these loopholes. Barack Obama has ma made no secret during the 2008 campaign that he was benefiting from campaign finance laws and spending lots of money, better than, than John McCain. So, um, you know, so uh, this has been going on for quite a while. And the question of whether, uh, whether Citizens United itself is going to have a real impact on this you know, that, I think that's a, that's a question. Uh, I'm not clear uh, uh, what the answer is, is going to be there. 
Um, okay, so the second point then is about labor unions, because in terms of whether Citizens United itself uh, was going to have a consequence, one of the arguments was is that labor unions, um, and by uh, some correlation, working class uh, voters, working class Americans, uh, would be hurt by, uh, by the decision. Uh, the reasons uh, given are, are such. One is that uh, unions did very well under uh, current campaign finance laws. Um, in fact, uh, going back to the 1970s when uh, the Federal Election Campaign Act was passed, labor unions were one of the chief supporters. The idea at the time was, um, and this was before uh, issues of soft money, before issues of uh, issue ads and attack ads and so forth, but when it came to direct spending, the idea was you could give a certain amount of money to a candidate. And, you know, in the real democratic sense, uh, it was thought that unions, if every union worker gave $5, um, or as this turned out, many union workers had to give $5 or $10 or more, uh, part of their money, um, then the union itself uh, could spend, could compete with corporations because both sides were capped at, a, at an amount that was manageable uh, for unions to compete. Um, so unions supported this at the time, uh, and it was thought that today if you take away that cap, um, that corporations could spend exponentially beyond the cap, whereas unions, they're already kind of maxed out. Right. It's important to add to this um, that if you were to look online in 2008 or in 2006 or really in any year between the 70s uh, up till today, uh, the labor unions in terms of the top 10, top 20 spenders in the United States, labor unions are always some of the big spenders. They, they do spend a lot of money um, on campaigns, mostly Democratic Party campaigns. Uh, they help Democrats uh, at times win, win campaigns. Overall, unions, uh, if you, you know, in terms of top 20, they spend a lot. But if you broaden that to the full sphere, unions are not, you know, not competing that well. They're, they're not doing badly, uh, but they're certainly uh, being outspent by corporate money. And the fear of, of Citizens United, again, is to take the cap off um, that uh, unions will then, that corporations can keep spending and unions are already maxed out. That's, that's the, the fear. Um, a couple of comments then on this possibility. One is, it's interesting, labor unions were split on Citizens United even before it came out. Um, uh, famously, um, or at least within union circles famously, uh, the AFL-CIO uh, supported uh, what would be the majority decision on that. They wrote an amicus brief on, on its behalf. They see themselves, uh, and in fact still there are a number of labor unions today that see themselves, at least for the 2010 election, benefiting from this, being able to spend more money. Um, this is a split, has become a real split in the, in the union movement. Um, a number of unions disagreed with this early on, disagree with this now, on the rationale that uh, at least in the long run, they're going to be, they're going to be up against uh, some long, long odds. Okay, so that that's at least complicates uh, the story uh, involving unions. Um, but let me just add then an, another point about this uh, with unions and then more broadly about the implications here for working class voters. Um, just as when I started, you know, mentioning uh, both Larry Bartels and Marty Gillen's work about the inequality that is, has been uh, dramatically occurring in the, in the modern era, um, this era in which labor unions have spent a great deal of money under campaign finance laws is also an era in which labor unions have declined from about a third of the private workforce uh, to under 10 percent. So now, is this union money being significant in terms of it being spent on behalf of working class voters? Yes, in certain ways. They have had some, some uh, consequential victories, especially in midterm elections. Uh, they've helped with health care reform in a number of states. They've helped with uh, uh, passing uh, higher minimum wages and some workplace laws. Have they helped the unions, per se? Not, you know, the evidence is, is mixed uh, and probably uh, shakily mixed uh, at best. Um, so again, um, to continue a theme uh, from the beginning, um, is this, is Citizens United the problem or is, is there something much more broadly going on, uh, probably more to the latter uh, than the former? Okay, so then to the third comment, um, the role of the court uh, in, in, in policy making. Uh, when, when Citizens United came out, um, a number of people uh, linked it or, or uh, saw similarities between this case and the uh, New York v. Lochner decision uh, of 1905. Um, a decision uh, of the uh, first Gilded Age uh, when the Supreme Court was defending uh, the right of free enterprise against uh, the attempts of governments, uh, in, in the case of Lochner, a state government, to regulate the economy. Um, and the Lochner era is infamous now for being seen as where the court was out of step with the public, the public trying to regulate, uh, the court stepping in and stopping it. And it would be uh, roughly 30 years later that uh, the court rescinded and, and Franklin Roosevelt uh, during the New Deal was able to accomplish uh, much of the regulation we see today. Um, is this a similar type of case? Uh, there seem to be some differences here. Uh, one, um, this isn't the government versus the courts. 
The government is fumbling on this issue. You know, both sides, both parties benefit from a lot of the, uh, the loopholes, the, technica the technical differences that enable them. Uh, Obama benefits from free spending uh, really as much as, as the Republicans did, at least in 2008. It is not clear, absent uh, court involvement, uh, whether this is a problem that could be solved, whether this is a problem that could get better. Um, this is, you know, if you really want to look for consistent fighting for campaign finance reform, I guess you would point uh, to John McCain. You might also point to Feingold. You might also point to Ralph Nader, who, with his, you know, half of 1% to 1% of the vote, um, you know, struggles uh, in, in a context where both political parties um, get a, a, a lot of money uh, from corporate money, uh, from, biz from other businesses, um, uh, and, and so forth. So is this a similar type of case? That seems to be unclear. Um, should the court stay out um, a, of a matter where the government has spoken? I mean, one of the clear things, as John said, you know, the, the government did pass reforms. There were attempts to change this law. It wasn't a very successful law. It was a law that was being evaded uh, pretty consistently, um, but it was an attempt. And certainly the court didn't step in to say that uh, they're going to try to be reformers and, and correct the errors of, of the government. Uh, they stepped in on, on behalf of uh, First Amendment grounds. Um, but nonetheless, it, it, it does raise a question here. I mean, the government is itself failing, and it's not clear in the government where opportunities uh, for success lie. Um, to lead this to a conclusion, I, I believe we do need reform. Um, but we need re we needed reform prior to Citizens United, and I, I would see Citizens United as you know perhaps spurring some type of challenge, as, as uh, you know Barack Obama uh, stated at the State of the Union, despite the fact that again he benefited quite nicely and will continue to benefit quite nicely uh, from campaign finance laws under its current context. Um, so I do think we need reform. I don't think Citizens United, um, unless it's it's some type of of a mobilizing force, I don't see it as being itself a a, a chief decision or a chief change uh, in that. In that aspect. Thank you. So I'm going to try to focus my comments on what to expect, and most of my comments are based on talking to the people I know who run campaigns and sort of what their fears and worries are, and sort of looking at broad trends. So I think if we look at the way things like how 527 the use of 527s has increased, how ballot initiatives have played through um, the state over the decades. Uh, we can start to get an idea of what this will look like. And I'll focus almost all of my attention on the corporate side, because I don't see many of the reasons that um, Paul stated, the union side of the equation changing much at all. I don't think they can get a lot more money. They can already endorse candidates. Um, so I mean, getting that union endorsement is pretty important in some areas. So I, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of change on the union side. But I, I think that corporations will slowly start to move into a more aggressive stance on elections. Um, and they already do spend a lot of money trying to influence government policy. They spend a lot on lobbying, um, and they spend a lot on ballot initiatives. And um, my guess is that they're going to move into electioneering. And why would they do this? Well, I mean, for starters, I'll just state the obvious, that governments make a lot of decisions that are pretty influential to businesses. Right? They set their tax rates. They look at different types of labor laws or consumer safety laws, or they regulate different things, whether it being their environmental um, pollutants or whether they can import or export, what their relations are with, uh, who they can trade with by foreign national companies. And I think businesses are really smart. And they want to try to get as much money out of their business model as possible. And so savvy investments in lobbying um, people in Congress or getting regulations passed through ballot initiatives in states can be a very rational expense for business. If you think like how much they spend on research and development, um, oftentimes in the billions of dollars, right? Or you can go into the California market and for you know about $20 million you can get something on the ballot which might increase your profits there by even more, right? They'd make that investment in a second. Or they can oppose a ballot initiative posed by some consumer advocate who'd hurt their profits um, they would be very rational. In fact, they'd be doing their stockholders a disservice if they didn't fight this. So I think that much the way that we've seen lobbying increase over time and the expenditures on lobbying, um, and we've seen the amount of money spent on ballot initiatives just explode over the last decade, that we'll probably see corporations start to spend more money um, in campaigns. And they're going to do it in a pretty savvy way. They're just going to calculate the returns on investment just as they would any other part of their business. If we're going to invest in a new machine, what will it ultimately earn us? If we're going to invest in research and development, what sort of expected returns do we have? If we're going to support a certain electoral strategy, oppose certain people, or support other people, how are we going to go about doing it? 
Um, I mean, how much we do it? And I, I, I think that this is, it may not see it immediately. Um, these types of things take a while to develop, but over time, there's, I, I'm, I'd be shocked if it didn't happen. Um, how are they gonna do it, right? Because um, you can't just give money to candidates, right? And you don't wanna put your name out there. Like, so General Electric supports, you know, uh, Barbara Boxer. You're gonna alienate a whole set of America if you endorse one side or the other, right? So what they're gonna do is take the strategy that 527s have used, right? The whole point of five, McCain Feingold was try to clarify things, but by creating 527s, it actually put everything in a black box. We have no idea who funded them, we just put in money. So a set of corporations can get together and either through a trade group or something with a nice sounding name like Citizens Against um, Imprisoning Children, or who knows, right? Um, they can put in money into these organizations and have these organizations run attack ads opposing people or you know, doing fluff pieces on candidates that they like, although I think those will be slightly more rare. And um, they're gonna, yeah, they're gonna buy ads, which they can do a lot of, and what corporations spend on consumer advertising far exceeds what politicians can. So if you figure Procter & Gamble is willing to spend you know, lots of money to promote Tide, um, and they think they might get a bigger bang for the buck by promoting a candidate, the amount of money is trivial for them. Um, they're gonna have a flood of mail, phone calls, there's an entire industry to hire people to knock on doors and collect signatures. I mean, like, so everything that they want to do, you could sort of have an instant campaign. Um, just drop money, hire a manager, and off you go. Um, and I don't think that this is gonna be about, I think there's gonna be a real difference between what came before and after, right? Because having an issue ad, I don't think this is effective, right? I mean, so coming from Notre Dame, there are certain people at my university who have very strong views on a particular issue. And so they happen to know which candidate is pro-choice and pro-life ahead of time, and having an ad is not gonna influence their vote one way or the other. Right, and so I don't think it's any accident that the most effective ads against Kerry in 2004 didn't come from like, Kerry opposes drilling in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, right? It was a swift boat attack, which really called into question um, his competence as a leader and his sort of veracity, and like basically called into his ability of trustworthiness. And so running these, throwing, you know, detail, what's the, um, well, there's an anecdote about LBJ, right? trying to uh, paint his um, opponent in an unflattering light, he said, look, just go tell these newspaper reporters that my opponent fornicates with pigs, using not quite such polite language. And he said, well, that's not true. So I was like, yes, but I'd like to see him deny it. Right, and so I get him talking those terms, and if you pour this type of money into these campaigns, you can start to set the tone of the debate. And I think if you call into the trustworthiness of your opponent, people on the fence, those people you can affect um, will start to be influenced. So I, I anticipate you'd see a lot of these shell organizations up to enhance corporations' interests um, running more ads on behalf of candidates or more explicitly attacking particular candidates. Um, okay, so what's our effectiveness? Like, I, I think it's only gonna matter on the margins, right? It's not like we're gonna start to say like the United States government as sponsored by Walmart or anything like that. I mean, um, because I mean, a lot of these, like the issue ads are out there Right, and you can still do the lobbying. Um, but I think you're gonna see corporations being very savvy about promoting a few people who will be very friendly to their interests, and more to the point, opposing people who have made themselves unfriendly to them, for whatever reason. Like Barney Frank would start to be a target a lot, right? Um, and this doesn't mean that you're instantaneously gonna have um, Mr. Burns from The um, Simpsons up there. Right, sort of like we're gonna enslave children and that's gonna be perfectly legal and I, the competitors are gonna have to run reasonable candidates, right? So the, the, again, the difference isn't gonna be like we went from Hugo Chavez to Pinochet, right? It's gonna be more along, I mean, Ralph Nader would sort of say that there's no difference between the candidates now. Um, I think this will only sort of further that, right? Where you're gonna get far more, like anyone who really opposes business interests is gonna face a much tougher electoral road, and so people will be less likely to do it. They might still win, and in certain areas of the country, they might, um, but I think in general, it'll be a harder slog, and so you're less likely to see those candidates opt in, and when they do opt in, you'll be less likely to see them succeed. Um, so this is gonna be sort of on the margins. It's not gonna be every election, right? I mean, so in San Francisco, 
they're not going to get like really corporate friendly people, except for it's the IT industry. The IT industry will continue to be protected because everyone works for that industry. Um, but I, I think you'll start to get some marginal districts replaced with other ones. So you start to see a few decisions come down. So who might lose? I mean, you expect to see groups with diffuse interests, like um, consumer protection, right? That's going to be something which will probably have less teeth to it. Um, environmental protection, like OSHA, will probably have like less um, teeth to it. Um, you might also see some small businesses who are currently, you know, struggling with um, competi um, competition with much larger industries start to lose out um, because they can count on the support of their local people, but their money might, well, it's going to pale in comparison, right? So an issue like net neutrality where some providers, the big corporations, the big telecoms who want to control all the pipes will have a lot more influence, or this will give them a potential megaphone which they might use. Um, in federal elections, I'm not sure how much difference you'll see, because there's already so much money that the marginal dollar spent there probably won't matter as much. Maybe in some small states, like South Dakota, it might matter more. Um, but in state elections, which the ruling doesn't directly apply to state elections, and it'll take some time to work through, but eventually, if the logic holds, I think it would have to eventually, but I'm not a constitutional scholar, so I can't speak to that. But in state elections, this would have a potentially very large effect because the amount of money that spent on those elections is very small. And so if a corporation wanted to make a difference, you could probably swing a state election pretty easily just by giving a megaphone to, or highlighting the negative qualities of people who oppose you and running very reasonable candidates who just happen to be more friendly towards your position. Um, so I think it'll be a gradual creep. It won't be like all of a sudden you'll see GE sponsoring um, candidates, but you'll see these shell organizations start to gradually run more and more ads. I suspect they'll be negative, maybe they'll be positive, but I think they'll be mostly negative. Um, and they'll be pretty savvy about where they place it, right? So they'll try to get those marginal districts where they think that opposing this particular opponent of our industry will make the biggest difference. <clears throat> you don't mind, I'm going to get up. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know that this is going to be a, a huge uh, political turning point. It's impossible to judge. Uh, I, uh, I, I disagree with uh, John that it's just a small doctrinal matter that the court rejected the equality rationale in its uh, decisions. Um, in this case, uh, a slim majority of the court, 5-4, has said that as a matter of constitutional right, corporations uh, can spend unlimited amounts of money on independent campaigns to influence elections. And so uh, the decision is overwhelmingly unpopular with the public, but because of the grounds on which uh, it was made, uh, Congress can essentially do nothing uh, about it. Um, it puts individuals and corporations' First Amendment rights on the same plane. That is really the, the most important aspect of it. it and you know, should we think about corporations in that way? Um, in a passage from the Dartmouth College case that Justice Stevens quoted in his dissent, uh, Chief Justice uh, Marshall famously said, a corporation is an artificial being, invisible and tangible, and existing only in contemplation of law. Being the mere creature of law, it possesses only those properties which the charter of its creation confers upon it. So, Whatever life corporations have, whatever rights they have, ought to be considered a matter of policy, not as being derived entirely from the Bill of Rights and therefore beyond the legislative power to modify. It seems to me, moreover, to have been entirely fair and properly constitutional to have required, as we did until this decision, that contributions uh, to uh, campaigns, independent campaigns in this case, come from individual citizens rather than from the corporations uh, which enjoy uh, the privilege of mounted liability. Corporations, of course, don't have the vote to write in the, to, uh, the right to vote in elections, at least not yet, and neither should they have uh, uh, an unrestricted right to spend their money to influence how others vote. Uh, it isn't as if those who control corporations are an underrepresented minority and need to be protected not only in their right to use their own money for political campaigns, but also to reach into the corporate treasury and spend money that is not theirs. In his opinion, Justice Kennedy writes, 
The censorship we now confront is vast in its reach. The government has muffled the voices that best represent the most significant segments of the economy. But no individual's voice was muffled. What was limited was the ability of corporate management to use the resources of corporations to amplify their own voices and, in effect, to muffle other people's. The majority has conjured up a fictitious form of censorship, the censorship of the most powerful organizations in this country, and shielded from its eyes the real effect of unleashing corporate cash. Now, in an earlier decision that the majority was overturning, Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce, uh, the court had referred in 1991 to, quote, the corrosive and distorting effects of immense aggregations of wealth that are accumulated with the help of the corporate form and that have little or no correlation to the public support for the corporation's political ideas. And it seems to me the court had it exactly right that last, uh, at that time, this decision was wrong and it is gonna lead to a lot of mischief. Now the only op optimistic interpretation of the decision, uh, as far as uh, I can see, is that uh, the limitations on the political influence of big money were already so limited that eliminating this restriction won't make that much more of a practical difference. But I don't really believe that. I doubt we'll ever know the true effect of this decision, because so much of the impact may be in the form of deterrence, that is deterring members of Congress and state legislatures uh, from offending business interests simply in the anticipation of the money that those interests could throw into the elections against them. Uh, consider, for example, the pending decision of Congress on health care reform. Both employer groups and the insurance industry are now mounting advertising campaigns against passage of the final bill. They're focusing on Democrats in marginal districts who may then well expect that these same corporate interests will throw their weight into campaigns against them in November if they vote for health care reform. There is no way we're going to be able to know to what extent Citizens United has affected the outcome of the health care vote if in fact the bill is brought to a final vote, which it may not be if the opposition is successful. We may also never know how much corporate money is eventually funneled into elections because it can be channeled through nonprofit intermediaries that effectively shield the companies from being publicly identified with their political views. And that same problem of obstructed connections may also make it difficult to assess whether this decision has provided a means for foreign influence on American elections. In the passage of the State of the Union address in which he denounced the Citizens United decision, President Obama alluded to the court having opened the way to foreign money in American politics, and it was just at that point that Justice Alito shook his head, uh, denying you know, that, that that was the case, I think. But in fact, the decision allows precisely what the president referred to, because even an ostensibly an American-owned company could be a channel for foreign money. Well, of course, people elsewhere in the world do have a lot of at stake in American elections. And now the Supreme Court has finally given them a say at least it's given foreign corporations or foreign governments a means of manipulating American elections. The very justices who have opposed even so much as a citation of another country's judicial decisions now find themselves caught on the horns of their own contradictory impulses. So what is to be done? Well, as, as many of you know, Senator Schumer, Representative Von Holland, have proposed a bill in response to the decision that would try to mitigate its effects. Unfortunately, some of the provisions, such as a ban on contributions by corporations that have received bailout money or that are federal contracts, are likely to be overturned by the court. Remember, the decision that treats corporations as having the same First Amendment rights as individuals, that if you have a government loan, do you think you should lose your rights to free speech? Of course not. So I doubt the court is going to sustain those limitations. The Schumer von Holland bill would also try to limit foreign corporate influence would require corporate donors to be identified, for example, in uh, disclaimers and TV ads. <coughs> Those provisions are probably worth enacting, but uh, I doubt they're going to be very effective. While the Schumer Van Hollen measure is probably worth passing, mainly for the disclosure rules, the more significant response to the court's decision should come in the form of a complete shift in the strategy of campaign finance reform. Uh, my colleague at the American Prospect, Mark Schmidt, recently wrote, the really significant effect of Citizens United is in finally closing off the approach to regulating money in politics that has been dominant since Watergate, an approach based on limits and then on closing loopholes on those limits. The limits and loophole closing approach was already exhausted with 
court has now drawn a line under it. There should be no illusions that a few legislative patches can make the limits created by mccain final work. Now, I, I agree with, uh, with, what, uh, with what Mark Schmidt wrote. Uh, I've long been skeptical about the whole approach of campaign uh, finance spending limitations. Uh, when mccain final was under debate, I broke with a lot of my friends and opposed the bill. I wrote at the time that the problem with the legislation is that it couldn't be uh, constitutional and effective. If it was constitutional, it wouldn't be effective, and if it was effective, it wouldn't be constitutional. <laughs> I also objected to the criminalization of what had long been normal political communication and coordinating campaigns conducted by candidates and other groups, and I worried that in the hands of politically-minded prosecutors, campaign finance laws could become a means of intimidating and, in some cases, disabling the political opposition. The one thing that I've long believed that Congress and state legislatures can and should do is to enact some form of public financing uh, for campaigns, uh, like the, the, the clean money laws, the clean elections laws. But it's not as though I've been very optimistic uh, about that approach. The declining portion of taxpayers who check off the box uh, to give a dollar uh, to uh, presidential campaigns, a check off that doesn't cost taxpayers any money at all, is testimony uh, to the limited public enthusiasm for public financing. But there's been some progress uh, in clean elections laws in the states, and there's now a bill, the Fair Elections Now Act, with 133 co-sponsors in the House, which is probably the most constructive action uh, that Congress uh, can take. And that is uh, a bill that would provide for uh, federal uh, financing of campaigns for Congress if candidates raise uh, uh, certain thresholds of donations uh, in, in small, uh, uh, from small donors, uh, uh, contributions would be limited to 100. Uh, for a congressional race, you'd have to reach some target level. For a, uh, a state, uh, for a Senate race, uh, a higher target, and then there'd be matching money for primaries and general elections. Um, the difficulty with this uh, kind of approach is that uh, realistically, um, uh, people who complied with this law past would undoubtedly found them, uh, find themselves outspent uh, by other candidates who didn't, uh, who didn't uh, go along with it. But the internet, I think, does offer us at least some little basis uh, for hope. It's been something of a, of, a, of, a, of a modest political equalizer by making it possible to raise small donations and creating alternative channels of political communication. So between something like this fair elections, this Fair Elections Now Act and the new environment created by the internet, you know, there is some, still some possibility for the public to prevail when it comes up against the power of money. Well, thank you all. I think at this point, I, I would imagine there's some disagreement among the members of the panel, and so we'll let each of you have a, have a word, and then we'll open it to, to questions. There's two microphones down here, and I think it would be best if you came down to the mic. Let me, um, let me frame a, a, a comment this way. The various ways that Hillary the movie could have been broadcast or circulated, um, one, in the way it was, with help from corporate contributions. Two, an alternative way. Well, a very wealthy individual comes forward and just bankrolls Hillary the movie. Or three, the makers of Hillary the movie um, call up some friends they have at Fox News and say, do you want to run this from 10 to 11 tomorrow night? Only the first of those would have been prohibited prior to this decision. And it becomes an interesting question then is why, what difference does it make between a media corporation running this versus a wealthy individual funding it versus a non-media corporation. And one way of looking at the decision is, is to remove that imbalance between the three and to say all three of these could now contribute to the running of Hillary the movie. And so one question would be is why, for critics of the decision, what one would have to do is why should we make the distinction in the way that would be before and what would be the justification for doing so? And so I took the majority in the, in the decision essentially challenging the grounds of finding unpersuasive any reason for distinguishing, which is not to say that one could distinguish, but that would be the challenge that we think. Um, well, yeah, one, one right. reason that we might make a distinction is that the First Amendment specifically refers to 
freedom of the press. Now, I know there's a big distinct, a big uh, debate as to how we interpret that, uh, but if you, uh, if you go back to uh, uh, the 18th century, uh, freedom of the press was believed to be a bulwark of liberty because the press would stand as a separate institution for the state uh, and, and play a role in, um, uh, in checking government. So it stands uh, singled out, I think, by the First Amendment as having uh, um, uh, very particular rights. I think, you know, if you um, equate um, uh, all of the press with any corporation, um, you, you have um, uh, opened up uh, this channel for, uh, for big money to dominate politics. And it's, uh, uh, that's why I think it's worth preserving that distinction. I just say, I, mean, I, I agree with a lot of what Paul's saying, but I, I just think, and I think you would agree, it, it, this began decades ago, and I just don't see, I mean, the corporate era has, has been dominant, uh, it, you know, really since the early 70s. So a number of historians have been studying this and looking at the rise of, of, of business. And, you know, the answer is, I mean, when you read the historical studies, what are the, what are the things they look to? One is, is mobilization. There was a great deal of business mobilization in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, often in response to the New Deal. Um, the second um, is union busting, um, which is massive during this time. Um, and and you know, I think the decline of unions, uh, union, the only place the unions haven't declined is in campaign finance spending. That's the only place they actually still maintain power. Um, and then globalization. Uh, and then fourth, and, and I don't know how to uh, uh, you know, encapsulate this, but there's a certain corporate culture that has, has become dominant now that wasn't dominant even 15 years ago. And you see this, you know, I, I know, uh, when I went to college, uh, our university, uh, this is uh, in California, UC Berkeley, tried to have a corporate sponsor uh, for, their, for their basketball arena. Um, and it was booed out of, uh, the, the, the response was uniformly, absolutely no. Um, and I went back last year, and it's the AT&T AT uh, uh, arena, um, and all the students uh, there are not booing, they're wearing shirts with AT&T on their shirts. Um, <laughs> and Berkeley, so the Berkeley sign is actually this small, and AT&T is on the shirt. And it's just, it's, it's a different response. There isn't the, you know, corporate America in certain ways, want, it's, it's friendlier. And although I don't think Barack Obama's gonna wear a Walmart shirt, I don't think we're that far away from such things. When Stephen Colbert says he's sponsored by Doritos, um, I think there's a certain element of like, why not? You know, I think I think things have changed. Now, wh what explains that? You know, I'm not sure. Is that a product of campaign finance laws? You know, probably in part, but but I'm not sure what 2010 the sea change is going to be. I mean, I think the, the big difference between an individual and a corporation is the corporation has a much longer time horizon in theory, and the people making the decisions are removed from the process, so they're more likely to do it. Whereas, you know, Warren Buffett occasionally talks like he had this very amusing uh, op-ed piece where like whichever party got the most votes from McCain-Feingold, he would give a billion dollars to. And if McCain-Feingold didn't pass, then he could give the billion dollars to the party that got the most. And if it did pass, it would be illegal and he'd be off the hook. Um, but I mean, like, he doesn't do these types of things because ultimately, you know, I mean, how many more years is he gonna live, 20, right? I mean, Walmart presumably is gonna have a longer time horizon than that. Right, and it's actually Warren Buffett making the decision. Whereas, you know, you're sitting around a bunch of your corporate, you know, friends at J.P. Morgan. It's like, ah, let's all give each other, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of bonuses. That's kind of cheap, right? Let's <coughs> finance a movie on this politics person, right? I think that is a more likely scenario than all getting together. Like, well, you know, why don't we, when we're sitting out, you know, and having lunch, let's all write the checks and finance the movie themselves. I mean, they could all do that. That's in the realm, and whether it's that's so why I think these types of expenditures are just going to be more likely because corporations spend a lot of money on these types of, like, there's a very clear cost-benefit analysis. People are one step removed from it versus, like, if it's you, it's like, well, how much do I really care about this? So I, I just think it's going to be more likely. Um, normatively, whether it's different or separate legal entities, I'm not qualified to speak to, so I'll let experts talk about that.
Well put, but the, what I was talking about was the idea that uh, limiting corporate spending on elections. Um, now, the, the, uh, uh, I, I, I don't have the context of that exchange. So, you know, you're pulling something out of context and banning a book is not something that, uh, that any of us would approve of. The question is, however, who financed this? And it's not the publication of the book, it's the question of the financing that's, that, that, that is at issue here. And can, the, can, can corporations reach into their treasuries and spend unlimited amounts of money in the 30 days before an election to, to, to influence the outcome of the election? That's what the court decided. Uh, you know, and and uh, uh, I would like, you know, there, there, there are many other ways those things can be financed. As Justice Stevens said in his dissent, we're not arguing here about whether or not these things can be published or communicated. We're arguing about the means by which they can be financed. That's the, that, that, is the, that, that is the key thing. And whether or not the corporation can reach into its treasury to finance them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me start off with two points on, on that. One is that, I, and that's one of the reasons why I did flag judicial elections in my remarks as one of the areas that we want to take a particular look at for. And the reason why I see, you, why I think you would expect a noticeable difference there is that you really wouldn't run issue ads before in judicial elections. You would not run an ad, uh, Judge Johnson voted this way in the last election, call up Judge Johnson's chambers and tell him you don't want to vote that way, right? So that, that was not an issue ad there, and so there will be a bigger gap then. This would open up more ads that you wouldn't even be possible agreed with you. The other point, though, that I would say is that we, we do have, though, given that half the states already do allow or don't, don't ban these independent expenditures in states with judicial elections, we haven't yet seen, and I think there's more studies to be done on this to really tell us, any noticeable, obvious, dire differences or conclusions that have come from these states that allow it. But that's, that's those studies could be conducted in the next year. I, I expect this decision will be a real boon to such studies of that kind, and I'm prepared to say that we could well find some differences. I think you're very right to flag judicial elections in the states as a place to really keep a lookout for if the decisions will have um, important effects that would probably be the place to find them.
That's, that's the, the challenge in deciding is when can you, political speech is so valued that you really have to have a high um, reason or, or, or purpose and just rationale for doing so. And the one rationale that's consistently commanded support of the court is to keep out corruption. They've been willing to weigh this, this political speech is important. On the other hand, we have a competing concern and that is uh, reducing corruption and its appearance. The question has really been is, can you add on other rationales to that? And that's really been the debate going on in the last 20 years. Could you add an additional rationale that would allow the suppression of more speech, that is, for the purpose of equalizing influence? And that's really at the heart of Citizens United, that that other rationale had been gaining some scattered support in cases, and the real contribution of Citizens United was to say, we no longer find that persuasive. But what remains undisturbed is the idea that you can still try to limit corruption. And so the First Amendment might be uh, very clear in its language, and yet it's still uh, subject to balancing as the court has done. Okay. Yeah, well, in, in, just in regard to the First Amendment, you know, if you look back through the history of the First Amendment, so many of the great cases involved dissenters, groups that were relatively weak, court intervening on their behalf. Increasingly, in recent decades, uh, with the expansion of uh, uh, First Amendment protections of commercial speech, and now of the political speech of corporations, the whole function of the First Amendment is effectively turned upside down. It's become uh, a weapon of the most powerful uh, to dominate uh, the political uh, discussion. And this, of course, is uh, a decision that um, involves not just speech, but involves the uh, amplifying power of money. And um, the, the equation of money and speech, combined with the equation of individuals and corporations, you put those two equations together, and you get a, a situation where um, individuals uh, feel more and more powerless against the overwhelming power of large organizations. I mean, this is a, uh, a moment when there is tremendous cynicism in this country uh, about the power of uh, uh, special interests. And, uh, and here we find uh, a decision being defended in the name of the First Amendment, which is, in fact, only going to accentuate that whole pattern. It's, it's, it's uh, substantively, it is undermining uh, what democracy is really about. i just add, I mean, I think, I mean, the First Amendment is, Obviously, at one level, when we read it, a quite simple, simple uh, statement. Um, but throughout the 19th century, it was rarely uh, discussed by the courts, and it's, a, it's you know its understanding is something that has developed over time. And obviously, uh, when we're talking about it, we can take a sentence that is quite simple. But when we think of well, what does it actually mean, and what are the contexts it means, and what individuals uh, individuals with an S at the end, uh, free speech, who are we protecting? Uh, as John said as well, I mean. It, you know, you have problems of potential corruption, you have problems of potential drowning out of other speech. How do you enable everyone to be able to speak in an equal voice so everyone is both allowed to speak and everyone is allowed to be heard? Or maybe not everyone needs to be allowed to be heard. But at the least, there are many different rationales for the First Amendment. Um, these rationales are contradictory, some of them, um, and they all have merit, I mean, to a certain degree. There's, I mean, there's different principles behind it. There are those who argue that corporations are individuals. There are those uh, that argue, I think, quite emphatically, um, either that they are, but they can't drown out other individuals, or they're a creation of, of something else, such as the state, um, and can be regulated as such. Um, but certainly, I think at the least, um, our First Amendment law is complicated enough to recognize that there are distinctions, and those distinctions are meaningful, and we need to, we need to address them. I, I guess what I don't understand is, why isn't it enough that the shareholders individually have the right to do whatever they want with their money, the managers have their right. The employees all have their rights. The only thing that's at issue here is whether or not people can reach into the corporate treasury and use those enormous assets to overwhelm political development. Well, um, let, me, let me ask one more question. Uh, next steps, uh, since as you know, the court generally limits its decision to the issues that are presented to them. In this case, they uh, redefined some of the issues broader and issued a broader decision. So then the next question is, is this the end or of, of um, how we're going to, how the court is going to view 
campaign finance restrictions by the, by the government, or is this the first step? As we say, if they're individuals, why should they not be able to contribute directly to a political candidate? If they are individuals in their own right, why should they disclose who's behind them? Why, why do we not only need to know that it's uh, the, the you know, Citizens United for Puppy Dogs, and why do we, is, is this the, um, it, will there be more, I mean, there's obviously going to be more challenges as the court in its current configuration likely to go even further in terms of reducing government restrictions. I guess I would say I, I don't think this is a first or last, but a middle, um, and I think this has been ongoing, and I think, uh, as I've said before, I, mean, I think one thing that got overlooked in 2008, which was a major moment, is that Barack Obama didn't accept public financing uh, in his campaign, and that defeats the whole spirit of the idea of regulating finance. I mean, the idea is that if we publicly help candidates elect, get to office, then we're much more publicly involved. When he rejected that, and I think it's, I think it's mean, it, more meaningful in a certain way that he as a Democrat and as a liberal and as somebody who's supposedly uh, opposed to Citizens United, that he rejected that. And he said very, you know, he defended himself. He wasn't shy about the reasons why. He collects a lot of money. I think, you know, that was, if not itself, the death, because I think this has been a doomsday for a while, um, but it was yet another death knell on the idea, the, the aspiration um, that we would regulate campaigns and have them publicly funded. We've opened this up to to uh, corporate spending or to union spending or certainly to big money spending uh, for quite a while. And I don't know what closes the floodgates. Um, um, so, yeah. so we can have the ITT senator from New Jersey? I don't, I don't necessarily see, I mean, you know, in some ways it'd probably be a little more honest. I mean, it, but, you know, here's, but here's, here's a caveat on that is, I don't think we get an, I mean, we're, we're assuming corporate America speaks with one voice. And there are certain issues where it probably does. There are certain issues. There's a lot of issues, though, where it does not. Um, and what, you know, so we can hope that there will be diversity within that, and we can hope that there will be uh, wealth, you know, with, with different opinions. There are certain issues. This is why I keep bringing up labor unions, because where you do see corporate America in one voice is against labor unions. Those two are sides that have very different fundamentals about how they under, understand individuals, how they understand the workplace, how they understand the incentives of the workplace, the goals of the workplace. These are fundamental differences. Um, but a lot of other things, you know, so that's where you're going to see a, a united front. Perhaps healthcare, on certain ways, you'll see certain united fronts. But, but even there, you see businesses splitting over who can make money or who, you know, see different directions. So, so I think it, de it depends. That's never a great answer, but, uh, but it is. It's a lawyer's it, answer. Yeah. Yeah. How about the political sciences? Predictions? <laughs> Political scientists aren't supposed to predict. That's, that's <laughs> we get ourselves in trouble. <laughs> um, I, I think that you're going to see industries who care a lot. Like the oil industry has agrees on a lot of things. So if it comes down to you know Exxon versus BP, you're not going to see much of anything, right? But the oil industry certainly will go against people who are for strong, like against drilling and for protecting animals who in drilling areas or seashores, right? And that type of thing is going to come about. Um, I, I think it just depends on how creative the corporations are because things are kind of faddish, right? And so until you think of something, like, you may not do it, but once we're like, ah, we should actually be, say, handing out things to high school to the cool kids and all the other kids will start to adopt it, all of a sudden you start to see lots and lots of apparel companies and music companies doing exactly this, which you might say, well, if it made sense, why didn't they do it 50 years ago? Well, no one had thought of it 50 years ago. So imagine this scenario, right? Um, you are um, Exxon, and a common strategy, like why did Coakley lose this last election? Well, part of it is she had lots of money. Brown had no money. Now, if she had been, had a competent campaign, she would have bought up almost all the ad time leading up to the week before the election. And just anticipation that, you know, if I have to spend my money, I can, it's there. But instead, she didn't spend a thing. So when Brown actually got some money to buy time, he couldn't do it, where he shouldn't have even been able to. There should have been nothing he could have spent the money on at that point. Right, so GE has a lot of time. You think, well, here's some people we don't particularly like. Maybe they'll make it through the primary. Let's buy up lots of ad time. And if we like the can both cans going through, right, we'll just run ads for you know, our gas stations or how great we are for the environment or whatever you want to do. Because Exxon can always advertise, they always do. If we don't like these candidates, we'll pa seed our ad time to our friendly you know, puppy dog loving group and let them run attack ads on the candidate we don't like. 
right? This would be an entirely rational strategy for them to get rid of someone who would make mischief for them in Congress or in the legislature or in the state judiciary, right? It just takes like someone in the corporate is like, you know, this would actually be very cheap. It's well within our advertising budget and um, they could actually control when the opponents could buy our ad time because they would have buy this ad time like months in advance. Television stations be ecstatic. Could GE give the money directly to, I mean, the, is the next step for the court to allow GE to just give it to the candidate directly? Well, I think there's people here far more qualified to answer that than me. I mean, you'd ask about where the law stands, and, and one would always be hesitant to predict an end to developments in campaign finance law. That would be a most risky thing to do. But I would say that it's possible to, to identify a certain point of stability that the court has reached, and in two senses. One is in the doctrinal area. There's been this battle before about what's the status of this equality rationale, and now you have five justices clearly standing against that. Could that change? Yes, you would have to have a replacement on the court, but at least doctrinally it seems to have reached that point of stasis. And then the other question is, and this um, uh, in the Wisconsin Right to Life case, a 2007 decision involving a Wisconsin Right to Life that wanted to run an ad uh, within the McCain-Feingold window, there was some obvious, without getting too much into the, the uh, nuances of the case, there were some obviously splits within the conservative majority on that, and it was evident from that that those splits would have to work themselves out in another case, and work themselves out they did in this case this January. But uh, it's not evident in reading this case that you see any of those other splits to be worked out. So just from an internal court perspective, this seems to have some stability, which is not to say that we couldn't have a replacement judge. That's what it would have to take, though, in my view, to actually see a great extension or limitation of this decision. Any final comments? Well, then will you join me in thanking our panelists?